the question since we all design, and what Shonya said, I 100% agree with that. All of us are designing for A&M's ASHA workers. If you are to deliver, uh, and these products, majorly in the absence of a sustainable private primary healthcare delivery model, your primary vehicle to those customers are the government. If you are talking about any sort of semblance of scale, of course you have small non-profits doing amazing work, but if you want scale, at this point of time it's the government. So you are you're giving tools to the government machinery. Here the customer, the end user, the beneficiary and the provider are, are completely four different things. So we are tool makers, as he said. The customer, the person who's paying for it, is essentially the taxpayer uh, who's empowering a minister or a IS officer to essentially write the check. The user is the ANM or the ASHA worker. The beneficiary is the patient. The only person paying the decision making happens at the IS officer level who's probably not seen a village. So he is making a decision based on what is the priority of my state. Oh, maternal mortality is high, I need to sort anemia, this makes sense, let's do it. The ANM doesn't want it. For the amount of money that she's paid, I would say she's doing double the work already. We can design a beautiful tool. We can design a beautiful tool for the ANM. We can immerse ourselves, we can understand, we can put ourselves in our shoes. But the truth is, if I am paid the amount that an ANM is paid, I won't get out of bed. I will just sleep my day through. So we have to understand we are designing for people who have no say in the procurement process. Now then, it leads us to what do we do about it. Many states have privatized uh, the, the structure. They are essentially giving out PHCs to private non-profits, for-profits, whoever bids for it. So the ANMs come under a, a private companies um, or a non-profits. Um, they, they report to the non-profits. So you can design incentive structures around it. It could be financial, it could be non-financial. But the, if you if you are designing tools for the current government system, it's a dead horse. We are still following the 1952 Joseph Bore Committee. There's nothing that has changed. Nothing that has changed and we cannot design for that. So unless there is a move towards privatization and if I, if I um, look at it from the other way, there are risks of that as well. The moment you privatize healthcare, the public healthcare collapses. So you have to privatize it and then you have to keep some price control as well so that people like us don't get crazy and greedy. But without that, like he said, if we don't think about the incentive structures of the people who are actually delivering this care, there's no point making tools. There's absolutely no point making tools. Okay. I have to say I disagree here. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, I mean, first of all, what we have learned is that you may have the best product, but if you just throw it in the market, it may not necessarily work. And irrespective of whether that's a pharmaceutical product, a device, or a diagnostic. So what, we, what we've done is we use design thinking. Uh, uh, in, so we test with consumers, we test prototypes with consumers to in, increase uh, user acceptance. Um, the second thing, and I think that is really most important, uh, is that we we are uh, trying. We were looking for behavioral modification via incentivizing healthy behaviors, and we have, we have what we have learned is that this actually works, and it has nothing to do with bribing. If someone, reg if let's take a woman who regularly comes for her breast cancer prevention, she gets a bonus or a voucher which will uh, lead to an increased payment for the next, for the next uh, uh, screening um, examination. Or it could be a voucher for a chronic care condition or for an essential medication. And we have learned that that voucher system works very well. And what we've also learned is that you need to not only incentivize the patient or the end consumer, but it also makes sense to incentivize the community health worker and the health providers to make sure that their patients come back for refill prescriptions and for uh, additional screening tools. And that's exactly 
the way uh, way we're moving forward, and that has proven to be a, a model that works. If we don't have a sustainable model, and unfortunately, whether we as entrepreneurs like it or not, just relying on the public health system is not going to be sustainable for us. So I'm sure uh, Biosense, which is farther down the line than us, yeah. kind of already realized that. 60% private sector. Absolutely. 100%. Right, so we, though we all uh, set out with idealistic vision of saying that we want to make a dent in the country, uh, cater to the masses who are currently are not access, do not have access to a quality health care. But the reality is if we have to have a sustainable business, as startups, we cannot just rely only on the public health system. Um, hopefully Anushka should do something about it, uh, change the <laughs> through her draft policies, but the reality is that. So uh, essentially we need to have a mix and match and a balance of both. And uh, as Saura said, that will only happen if you have a private players also being willing to buy into your products and giving you those revenue streams to make it sustainable to then address the public health system, which is of course a larger and a longer term play. But then this is more of a roadmap or a milestone that we need to achieve to get on to that. Abhishek, I'd like to... I'll talk about the wait. other 40 Yeah, 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 because you've been around the longest and even though it's 40% of your customer base, uh, you've had a significant learning curve in terms of quoting and successfully, unsuccessfully, but you have 40% of your customer base from the public sector. I'll come back to his yeah. question. Yeah. <coughs> Out of 100 IS officers in the country, 20 are thugs. <laughs> 40 are okay, 20 are good, and 20% are amazing. Mm -hmm. We have a list of that 20% who are operating as a principal health secretary in probably five or six cases. Those are the people that we do anything and everything to win over. So if they say, I want a pilot tomorrow, we will invest five people, Shauru has seen, uh, the way we operate, we make sure that we are there at the doorstep tomorrow and we just execute what he said. And we keep doing it, we keep losing money by the way. We keep doing it till the principal health secretary is firmly behind us. And then we have captured this data. Once the PHS is there, unless he has a major problem with the minister, which is also <laughs> very, very likely in, in many, many cases, unless there is a major issue or the state and centre have different governments, which is also possible, uh, so uh, these are the three variables, good PHS, no major difference between state and center. So if you have a Congress PHS, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> no major problem between PHS and minister. Tick, 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 we go in that state. Okay. So it's a lot about uh, identifying that 20% that uh, is catalytic in some ways and cultivating a relationship with them and doing whatever it takes to um, win credibility with them. I think Abhishek is underselling the ability to execute, his ability to execute. Because finally the credibility comes from executing and what he's underselling, what he said very softly is we do everything to win over them. That everything is actually, the 10% the, the is you know the right selection but the 90% is executing mm -hmm. on that promise. So that they know tomorrow when they, they have a problem, they, they want to call you and say can you fix this for me. And I think, I think he, he softened his role because that's what he does well. But I think fundamentally there is a message for new businesses. It's, you know, it's the selling comes on the back of your ability to execute. Don't sell what you cannot do. So sell performance, don't sell promise. Uh, now you have a situation where uh, to be able to sell your products, you need to provide. So let's say you go with a paper use uh, subscription based model. Now, because now you're directly, your revenues are directly being affected by usage, the onus is also on you to make sure that there's a lot of use, which means that you not only have to think about developing products, you have, you have to bear the responsibility of creating human capacity, training, recruiting, training, supporting the people who are going to use your tools. And that can end up being a big distraction, a business in itself. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, what we have learned is, is the principle of stick to your uh, principal skills. And if you want to add additional services or product, then look for partners. And that has been a pretty successful approach. To give you one example uh, from Kenya, uh, where we want to establish under a micro insurance a holistic care system. And uh, 
what we've learned is we, we need to partner with someone who has access to a broad customer base. And who is that? A telecom operator, who happens to be a bank with M-Pesa at the very same time. And then what else do we need? Because we have no clue about insurance, so bring in a strong insurance partner. And there are a couple of German major insurance companies who have an interest in developing microfinance solutions. The interesting thing, and that's now an anecdote, that my Kenyan partners from the social entrepreneurs, when I asked them, so when do we bring in the government? Oh, don't bring in the government. Let, let's keep them out as long as possible. And last not least, there was a lot of physician banging uh, going on uh, early on, and I, I can build, relate to that because I became a registered nurse before I became a physician. I, I have to say, I learned more during these uh, two years of becoming a nurse than during the six years at university. It's a quick comment. Um, we work with the Wish Foundation also, and I was last week touring a lot of Aam Admi Mohalla clinics started in partnership with Wish, and I wanted to add to several problems cited by the panel here. We could make the best innovative products, services, and then you have to contend with the fact that a four-hour clinic sees 160 patients. Yes. We are talking about a minute a patient. And any kind of product is only going to disrupt the workflow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we all have to be cognizant of that and make sure this doesn't come in the way between the doctor and the patient. And the government wants an EMR. Yes. <laughs> and, and speaking of EMR, I live in the Bay Area and I have been in healthcare for 14 years. Uh, EMRs and uh, doctors in the US hate EMRs too. There's an entire business about making their life easier because of the EMRs. So, yeah. yeah, so I'm a biomedical engineer from UPenn, actually, a medical student out in the Bay Area. And so in the last eight months uh, here on a Fulbright, I've been just you know, looking at various things. But yeah, I've seen that uh, the first most appalling thing I saw was a doctor treating a patient through WhatsApp. I was, I, as an American, you know, having not seen that, it just blew my mind, being aware of HIPAA and all this, that. But, you know, at first, of course, my initial complete disgust was, like, followed with, like, my God, I mean, they're, they're actually treating patients in Guwahati from Bombay, you know, and Kerala and from wherever. But as, you know, regulations catch up, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the laws. I know there's equivalent in India, but is that illegal and we turn a blind eye to it? Is it legal? But if it becomes illegal, will it impact, you know, his ability to treat those patients? And if so, well, for, for you guys as entrepreneurs and me looking to, to enter this space, should we be constantly cognizant of those kinds of gaps closing and becoming uh, uh, un uh, synchronized with how it is in, in Western countries or developed countries? I think we're far deeper problems. We don't have a definition for medical device. We don't have a definition for lab technician. We don't have a definition for a doctor, except MBBS. So <laughs> I think this is the last of our concerns. Uh, honestly, we run labs through WhatsApp. Uh, we take care of patient privacy, we have HL7, but we cannot let, we cannot run Indian healthcare with a US mindset. This is the first thing that we have to understand. We can't. The numbers, what he said, just don't add up. So while we have to take the best from the Western worlds, we have to contextualize it. If you have 7 lakh doctors in a population of 125 crores and you say that no, WhatsApp treating is, at least he's getting some level of care. I was talking to a health minister. Somebody said, this is not the gold standard. He said, yeah, pe gold bhi nahi hai, standard bhi nahi hai. <laughs> <laughs> Do something, just take a step. Just take a step. I have a response to him. Uh, it is illegal. You look the other way. As long as you're not making a lot of money, nobody will care. Yeah, that's true. And you know, one small statistic to kind of... Um, put what Abhishek said into context in, in the US, in OECD countries, for every 10,000 people, there are 30 doctors. In places like uh, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, for 10,000 people, there are maybe two doctors, and they live in the cities. So if you have healthcare over WhatsApp, that's actually a lot. So. So great discussion, everybody. Thank you so much for making it in spite of, uh, you know, making it through the maze <laughs> into this room. And uh, thanks a lot to all the panelists for making time uh, despite their busy schedule.